Tom Salda, Managing Director of STAL, a CSIA Certification Auditor, will present Agile, Valuable Project Management Techniques for Integrators. This webinar is part of CSIA's efforts to promote and provide training around our best practices manual. Chapter 5 of the manual focuses on project management, of which Agile is one technique. A reminder that if you have questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A box to the right of your screen, not the chat box. This program, like many of CSIA's webinars, will be archived on controlsys.org, typically within 24 hours of the broadcast. Many thanks to John Weber, Monica Anderson, and the whole team at Software Toolbox for hosting and sponsoring our monthly webinars. Software Toolbox was created in 1996 to rid the industry of bad third-party software experiences. They do this by providing a variety of industrial automation software tools and applications. The knowledge of how they work together or with other automation software to deliver end-user value and a responsive, proven support process, all focused on lowering risk. Find them on the web at softwaretoolbox.com. Today's presenter, Tom Salda, is the Managing Director of Astel, a CSIA certification auditor. He led the Best Practices Training Workshop prior to the 2016 CSIA Executive Conference in Puerto Rico and will do so again in 2017 in Fort Lauderdale. Tom provides training in strategy and process and other highly relevant management areas. Prior to starting his company, Tom worked for Sage Automation, a CSIA certified member in Adelaide, Australia. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Southern Queensland and earned a graduate certificate in business management from the University of Adelaide. Please welcome Tom Salda. Uh, thank you very much, Tony, for um, the introduction. Um, I think we should, given our late start, we should get moving pretty quickly. So if you could go to the next slide, thank you. <clears throat> Tony, um, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Tom, you have control over this. So if you're looking at the top, you have it more like, if you click on your little slides up there, you have a one or two and you have an arrow and you can oh, move from slide to slide. Uh, there we are, thank you. Okay, so um, I, if you want to jump in with a question at any time, I'd use the Q&A to do that, um, like instructed. Um, and to share your insights as well. That'd be fantastic. Uh, it's really good to see so many attendees. Um, just for information for attendees, it's about 10 to 3 in the morning here in Adelaide, Australia. So um, I am awake. I've had a couple of, co couple of coffee, so I'm pretty good. Um, and you've already heard <clears throat> a little bit about me as well, so we won't need to go on to this next slide either. So we'll jump straight into it. So um, this morning we're just going to gain a broader understanding of what Agile is, where it's used and its benefits, and some of the commonly used tools and techniques, and specifically one, ones that we might use for uh, as a system integrator. Um, some Agile basics. Um, so this is the Agile Manifesto. Um, I teach certified um, project managers um, uh, the Agile um, project management methodology. Um, and this is one of the slides that we use for training as well. So you will see that the, um, the words on the left um, compared to the words on the right. So you note the, um, the sentence on the bottom that says, what that is whilst there is value and necessity in the items on the right, the items on the left are valued more. So um, in Agile, we value individuals and that interactions over processes and tools every time. Um, we we value working software solutions over comprehensive documentation, um, and we also value customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over doggedly following a plan. 
Um, so what does that all mean? That basically means that, you know, these things on the left are highly valued in terms of outcomes of projects. So if you're concentrating on doggedly following a plan or basically following your processes and tools to the letter without scaling them, um, you're really not going to get the right result or you'll be doing a lot of work for nothing. It is really important, as you would appreciate, to work very, very closely with your customer. Uh, and in Agile, um, that is something that we do um, the way, in the way that the methodology is set up. Um, and we'll, go, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. <clears throat> so how does Agile differ from other traditional approaches? So in Agile, we do use requirements just as, as much as you would with a, um, a waterfall methodology. Um, but in the traditional model, what we're trying to do is we're trying to set a design upfront with everything to be known. Um, and as we do know in normal project management methodologies or waterfall types, things do change along the way and that does tend uh, to put us in a contract negotiation or change of scope conversations a lot. Um, in Agile, products evolved using regular customer co collaboration. So whilst we've got requirements in, um, in Agile, um, we really don't know specifically exactly how this product is going to look or this solution is going to look uh, until we uh, start executing each one of the sprints uh, in, in an Agile uh, methodology. Um, and what we try and do in this traditional method is to get the product design signed off or baselined early in the project cycle, whereas in Agile we do have high level requirements, but it's up to the solution development team to work out what that um, solution is going to look like. In an Agile um, methodology, the project time and cost are fixed and the contingency is in the requirements, meaning that we do have some specific prioritisation techniques that we use in Agile um, to make sure that we deliver the, what we call the minimum user subset. Um, in the traditional style of uh, project management, project time and cost are variable where the requirements are fixed. Um, um, and that does cause us um, some problems in terms of what the uh, customer expected to pay and especially what we expected to deliver as well as a supplier of such a solution. We use this Moscow method of requirements prioritisation, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in a moment. Um, in the traditional method, we use fixed requirements that require or would normally require formal change processes to alter after they've been signed off. In Agile, we use highly collaborative and flexible team. Have a, we have a highly collaborative and flexible team culture, and it has to include the clients. So, if you've got clients that really just say we want this, and then you basically deliver it at the end of the project, um, it may well be there'll be a gap in understanding there, and you didn't deliver exactly what they thought. So, it requires um, the customer to be in very much involved in each one of the sprints um, that, we're, that we're carrying out. And that way we get, we're getting um, approval um, of the design as we go along rather than trying to approve the design at the start. Um, the project structure is a lot flatter, um, whereas in traditional project management we've got a more hierarchical, hierarchical and formalised kind of um, structure. Um, in Agile, the PM is not there to micromanage the project or the project members. Um, they're there basically to clear the path if there's blockages that are occurring um, during a development process. Um, in traditional project management methodology, there is a tendency or has been a tendency for PMs to be more directive and less empowering of the team that's developing the solution. Um, in Agile as well, we have a useful product that's delivered incrementally um, and in traditional method we have um, that all happening generally at the end. So what we mean by that delivering a product inc incrementally is that um, we're developing parts of the solution and when, when we're setting up the project plan, we're trying to think about how we would use aspects of the, of the product that have already been designed um, in deployment. So that way we get benefits um, delivered earlier. Uh, and we'll talk again a little bit about that um, 
uh, later as well. So these, this is um, this slide here is the um, for Agile Basics. Um, so you will see on the left-hand side um, we've got the traditional approach, and on the right-hand side we've got the Agile approach. Um, so you see um, on the Agile side the time, cost, and quality are fixed, and the features are prioritised using this Moscow method of prioritisation, which again we'll talk about in a moment. On the left-hand side. Um, the time and the cost become variable because generally what happens is that um, the scope changes along the way because the customer um, has different ideas about what they what they what they got compared to what was delivered, and then we go into negotiations and therefore the features um, whilst the features are, remain fixed, we do have some things that need that could be negotiated and um, they generally to be tend to be the quality aspects of the solution. <clears throat> so you can see here this is um, the traditional delivery versus um, model. So this is what's normally called a, a J curve, which m most of you, if you're involved in project management, would understand um, uh, very much completely. So you can see on the left hand side we've got um, the project start, and you can see that blue curve going into negative territory. Um, that generally means that we're sinking a whole heap of money or the customer is sinking a lot of money into a project and they really don't start getting their return on their investment until the project end, which is the bottom of the curve. So let's say for argument's sake we've got a million dollar project, um, that uh, curve at the bottom would match to minus one, one million dollars. If it turned out that we were getting a return on investment in terms of productivity, um, extra customers um, or any efficiency like that, we can start taking that off the million dollars that we've um, sunk into the project and eventually we'll get to a point where we've um, gained the, the million dollars back in terms of uh, return on investment and that of course is our break even point. And then post that is blue sky which is obviously profit for our customers. In the agile um, world, um, that is very similar, but you can see on the next slide here that we have the, the, red, the red line is all at once delivery, which means the benefits aren't realised until the project is ended and we've sunk all the money. Um, but in the agile world, we have usable outputs delivered in sprints and, and what, is, what is called project increments which means we're trying to deploy some part of the solution earlier so that our customer can use it earlier, which means that they can realise benefits earlier as well. Now you may well do that in a traditional um, uh, methodology as well in terms of how you set up your um, project, uh, but in terms of um, in Agile that's a, a desirable thing to do. And the reason for that is not only do you get a quicker return on your investment if you're getting um, product outputs that are useful and you can start getting benefits earlier, but it also gives um, the customer or our customer um, a lot of confidence that uh, things are being delivered and they're not having to wait six months for something to be delivered on the factory floor for argument's sake. They may have um, received something that they can use earlier, maybe within the first one or two months, and they can get a lot of confidence in the project team and especially the project manager um, that things are getting delivered and they can see things happening. That's really why it's very um, in a um, in an agile environment. Um, some of the other things we can use agile for, um, and this is an example that I like to use is you would see every now and again if you use um, your Apple apps or anything like that, sometimes you'll look on there and you'll see um, an app that's been developed um, only to a point where it is in basic uh, form. Um, now that forms that output there of that app in its basic functionality has been developed using um, sprints most of the time. Most um, modern software companies would use um, that release of that basic functionality as a um, in a sprint or at the end of a project increment. And the whole idea of um, putting that app on there is to is to gather information, to gather 
how many times that app has been downloaded in the marketplace. If the app has been um, downloaded you know, by 100,000 people, then they know that they've reached their project gate um, and they can go off and, and put the functionality in on top of that that people would actually pay for. Okay, so some more agile basics. We have this thing called Moscow prioritization, which is all, um, and we have four areas for that. So we have the must haves, the should haves, and the could haves, and the won't haves. The must haves are really important. The must haves are also known as the minimum user subset. Um, and that is things that uh, or requirements or user stories, as we sometimes call them, um, that need to be met. Um, and if they are not met or cannot be met, then the project is basically not viable anymore. Um, so they are very important and they can be legislative, they can relate to, in an SI sense, they can uh, relate to machine safety or electrical safety. So any requirements that you can think about um, that are uh, of that nature, they would be a must-have. Um, we do have things called should-haves, which are painful to leave out, and if they are left out, they may necess necessitate a workaround, um, but they're important but not vital. And then we have these uh, things called could-haves, which are pretty much the icing on, on a cake. Um, they're desirable but not essential, um, and there's less impact if we leave those out compared to a should-have. And really importantly as well, and if you get the time to do it with your customer, is what we're not going to put in this solution for now. But this is something that is often missed. These conversations are often missed with customers um, because you will get the kickback from the customer that says something like, oh, I thought I would get this in the solution. Um, I was expecting to see this in my solution. Um, but if we're really clear on that at the start and spend the time at the front end of the project and work out what we're not going to deliver for now, um, that's a really important uh, way of managing expectations of our customer. So there's some rules of thumb in terms of effort. So if you can imagine, um, we have um, a whole project which is estimated at the, at the start using an agile methodology. So let's let's say for argument's sake that we've got you know 100 um, requirements in our project. Now let's say those 100 requirements um, are an hour each. They would take an hour each um, to to solve each one of those requirements. That would mean if we wanted to use a rule of thumb, we would say that that 60% or 60 hours um, of the project would be would be must have. 20% of the project would be dedicated to delivering should have requirements and 20% of the project would be um, allocated to could have requirements. Now what we can see here is that um, we immediately have contingency in, um, in our requirements. We don't have it in time and cost, we basically um, estimate the whole project delivering all 100 of those requirements. Um, but we do have up to 40% contingency. However, um, normally in an agile project, what you're trying to do is use the 80-20 rule, meaning as your goal should be and your customer's goal should be to deliver 80% of the requirements. But you do have 20% um, of contingency in delivering those requirements. So you can see there that formal change control, so you can see basically that um, Agile is quite a rigorous um, uh, methodology. A lot of people call Agile a bit loose as a goose and, um, you know, it's people um, at, in Google sitting on bean bags and drinking Coca-Cola and just dreaming up, you know, um, wild ideas for um, producing solutions. But at the end of the day, if your must-haves are, um, are in there, these requirements are not negotiable, um, which means you do need some formal change control to change them. However, the people that are developing the solution um, at, the, at the bottom end of the project or at the delivery end, they are empowered, empowered to de-scope, meaning they can um, 
the scope on the could have requirements and that could be you know the look of a dashboard the style of a dashboard something like that which really doesn't make any difference in terms of the benefits that you're trying to achieve out of the solution um, but we we can leave them out should time and cost become a problem for us okay some of the uh, agile benefits um, the business is better able to direct development of the solution is more likely to feel ownership of the solution as it, as it evolves and, and most importantly as it transitions into live use. Really what they're saying there is that we have our customer intrinsically involved in the process um, and that is something that is sometimes hard for you to achieve with your customer. It depends on what your relationship is with them. Some, some people would just want to set and forget and say, oh, just go off and do it and tell us when you're finished. Um, but really valuable clients are the ones that want to see things as they're being developed and, and basically um, uh, approve them as we're going along. Um, the prioritisation enables a project to be delivered on time whilst projecting the level of quality via the minimum user subset delivery as a minimum, so those 50% of what's being delivered. And the risk of building the wrong solution is greatly reduced. The final solution is more likely to meet the business need and the reason for that is that we are incrementally developing the solution um, hand in hand with the client. Um, the deployment is more likely to go smoothly due to the cooperation of all parties concerned throughout the development. Okay. The more agile basic. So you have here, this is, could be any project management methodology. So any project has some sort of project mandate um, and that, could, uh, that can be some sort of feasibility study uh, which says okay just see how feasible um, this idea is, then a project board might, might approve um, further work to be done in a foundation space, basically put more meat on the bone of the project. But really um, this uh, particular um, methodology if we've got um, written out here isn't any different than a traditional model um, apart from the fact that we're using an ev evolutionary development process to develop our solution together with our client. Um, we normally um, set things up in terms of what we call project increment and what we do try and plan is to try to deploy some part of the solution at the end of every project increment. And to reach the project increment goals, we break those increments down into sprints. Um, and these sprints are normally two weeks, um, two to four weeks is the rule of thumb um, in terms of what a sprint length is. And the reason for that is that we try to um, break things down into very small chunks. So trying to uh, not to eat the elephant all at once, uh, but we're trying uh, to break um, a sprint into sort of two to four weeks so that we actually are uh, concentrating on delivering. Um, then we can have another project increment or many more project increments until we've built up our um, solution into the final solution and then of course we um, carry out our project closeout procedures and whatever they might be um, within your organisation. So there's really nothing mind blowing about um, the way that um, Agile projects are structured because it's very similar to any other methodology, something like um, Pimbok or Prince2 would have very similar ways of um, uh, representing how the project is going to be delivered. Now there's these things that we um, have um, and that we generally use in uh, Agile and so one of those things is uh, what's called a Kanban board. Um, a Kanban board really represents what we're doing in terms of one of those two to four week sprints. So you can see there, there's a picture of a couple of people that we've worked with recently. It's actually one of our customers and one of my, um, um, uh, one of my business partners. And you can see that there's a very um, basic Kanban board there. So on the left hand side, you see a lane there and that's basically tasks or user stories to solve. In the middle, we have um, what's happening uh, in terms of what progress uh, is, is occurring, so what jobs, what tasks are in progress. And on the right hand side, you can see there's a whole heap of um, post-it notes which represent all of the things that have been completed in that sprint. So from a project management point of view, this is not a Gantt chart. It is not 
something um, detailed with resources and things like that. Um, we do generally have some sort of overall Gantt chart that we use in Agile, but when we go down to the sprint level, the solution development team basically manages something like this, a, a Kanban board. Um, now these Kanban boards exist in various software applications as well, such, um, such as JIRA, um, JAMA, um, and also, um, oh, I can't remember the name for now, um, but it will come to me. Uh, but basically, if you um, uh, went onto Google and looked at Kanban boards, um, you would find lots. I think, yes, Trello is the other, um, the other application that you might use. A lot of people use that as a free application. So really, all of those post-it notes only have on there um, what the user wants, who's allocated to the task, um, how many, uh, how much effort that task is going to take, and on the back side of one of those um, cards or post-it notes will be the acceptance criteria. And the reason why the acceptance criteria on the back of each one of those tasks is really important is that we're integrating our testing and acceptance as we go along. So quality is very much built into Agile in that way. Um, so we can't move our post-it note into the right-hand side to the done lane, as it's called, until uh, all the acceptance criteria has, criteria has been met. And that acceptance criteria can be the customer has visualised this dashboard, has had a play with it, and they're happy with what they've seen. Um, the other acceptance criteria can be internal acceptance criteria in terms of code testing, um, peer review, any other quality, internal quality um, uh, expectations you have on, on your team. Here's some others you can see there. Um, you can see a user story, a to-do list, an in-process list to verify and a done lane in one of those. And you can see another one which has got something called a product backlog which we'll talk a little bit about um, in, in a moment as well. We also use very simple ways to represent progress on projects. Um, when we talk about things called user story points, and I'll explain user story points in a moment, um, we use what's called a burn down chart to represent that. So that can be a whiteboard in, inside of a team area, it can be a piece of butcher's paper on a wall, and basically in a sprint we're trying to maybe solve or complete 40 story points, so that would be the vertical line on, of all the y-axis would have 40 on it. And what we're trying to do at the end of our two to four week sprint is um, basically clear those story points to, to a point where we get to zero. And of course, if you've got a burn down chart, you can do the opposite and you can burn up as well, meaning as you solve user stories, uh, then you can um, incrementally add those, to a, a, add those up until you get to a target. Um, you can see that example there is a little bit different because what's happened is that the team has got to a point where they've, um, they think they can solve more user story points in that sprint um, than they originally intended. So they've put an extra bar up the top, an extra green step there. So what are these user stories? Now for me, user stories are like goals in terms of customer collaboration. <clears throat> and we use them all the time in our business when we're trying to um, <clears throat> get a good idea of um, what the customer actually wants. Um, because oftentimes, especially um, when I was working as, as an executive um, at Sage Automation, we would use functional requirements documents and we'd post them under the nose of our customer and we would attempt to get sign off on them. And depending how technically orientated the customer was, you know, they would look at those and go, yep, we're fine with those, we understand those because we've got a, um, a full engineering team that understands functional requirements. But some of our customers were not technically orientated and if you put a functional requirements document underneath their nose, they're not going to understand it and they're less inclined to sign off on it. Uh, and it is such an important step in any project to get a full understanding of what the requirements are. So an alternative is something called a user story. So these are, these are requirements communi communicated in a non-technical fashion that customers more readily sign up to. Um, so for example, as the production manager, <clears throat> which is a role, I want a daily report on the production line performance, which is a stated need, so that I can ensure our production targets are being met. 
And one thing about a user story is that it doesn't talk about solution at all. It talks about what outcome we're looking for. Um, for any requirement that we put down, we need to keep ourselves away from the solution for as soon as possible. That gives our, um, our development team flexibility in terms of what they can think of to deliver and still meet the, meet the user story or meet the uh, customer's requirements. <clears throat> so you can see there that um, that, re that daily report um, could be a big report. So you could break that user story down into um, further uh, detail. So you can see there, as the production manager, I want my daily report to show against daily targets the process, tonnage, and shipped product against any orders that I, so that I can be reactive to any problems. So at some stage during um, the development of this solution, somebody within this um, solution development team is going to show, well, will have to show as part of acceptance criteria, um, uh, some sort of report that shows that process tonnage and the shipped product against, against orders. If it does show that, basically, we've probably met with the must-have requirement for, for it. If the dashboard needed to, you know, to be you know, looking very funky and very nice looking, that could have been part of a could-have requirement. But at the end of the day, you know, if there's a number on a screen and it shows what it needs to show, um, even in a rough fashion, we probably um, got ourselves to a point that we've uh, met at least the must-have requirement. Okay, there is also something um, in Agile that we call a product backlog, which is simply a register where all of our user stories are located. So what the solution development team does is pulls from that, um, that backlog. So you can imagine if we've got um, three sprints um, and we've decided that we've uh, allocated certain user stories that we're going to solve with each one of those sprints, the solution development team is in charge of pulling from that product backlog and uh, allocating certain user stories to certain sprints and, uh, and ultimately to deployment. The solution development team estimates how many user stories they can achieve in a fixed time frame or a sprint, and that's generally two to four weeks, like I mentioned earlier, and the technical user and user acceptance testing are integrated into the sprint. Tests are part of the acceptance criteria for each user story, and that is really why um, Agile is a very valuable uh, methodology in terms of embedding quality into the process. Um, so we're making sure that everything is passing its quality checks and its acceptance criteria as it's being built. <clears throat> the depth that you do that to obviously is up to you, um, but obviously if you miss out tests or you decide to um, um, not test things one thing versus another, or you were in a bit of a hurry and decide you're not going to do things that you normally do, you're going to build errors into your solution. And especially in terms of software and code, um, the less you test at the lower levels and build up the solution, the more likely is you're going to have um, faults um, occur or errors occur in other arms of the solution that you didn't expect. So. That's something that is very um, well done and managed in um, um, for people that do um, Agile well. And all user stories are MOSCOs, and they have to be because we need to have our project contingency in there because project time and cost are theoretically fixed. Okay, so um, here is, um, I think it's the, the final slide um, of this presentation. Um, but here I've tried to represent, you know, the full um, process. So on the left-hand side there, you've just got an example that says there's, you know, a whole heap of user stories um, and we've got, you know, 15 of them written in there and, and maybe more. You, normally in a project um, you would probably have something like 100 user stories um, that you're trying to solve. Um, but you can see there that every one of those user stories ha has been prioritised. Now, prioritisation is such a difficult thing to achieve, not in terms of it being particularly hard um, in writing them down and gathering them, um, but actually getting people together, especially on your customer side, to sit down and, and, and understand that they're not going to get everything that they want. 
if we had um, a situation where they had, they wanted everything that they specified, then every single one of those user stories would be a must have, and therefore we wouldn't be using an agile methodology because it doesn't work, because we have no contingency. So one of the basic tenets in agile is the customer also understands that they're not going to get everything that they want exactly as they thought they would get it. They're happy for the solution to evolve along the way, and that means that to be agile, your customer needs to be agile as well. Um, I would hazard a guess to say that a lot of our customers in the um, system integrators environment um, probably are not amenable um, to that as a solution or, or that as a way of um, specifying their requirements. But at the end of the day, pragmatic customers um, that can uh, understand this and, and utilise it, get benefits as well. They pretty much get delivery on time, every time, at the cost that they thought they would, that, that, that was specified. But they do understand that they give up um, something along the way. They have to um, understand that some of these could have may not be delivered. It's a really important concept, but um, we work, we work, our company works a lot with um, uh, people developing solutions for banks. Um, and what the bank, uh, the bank would have or what their customer would have is essentially a team um, that owns the solution within the, the customer site and they are so, they are very much embedded in every one of those sprints. So they'll be popping along every now and again um, to have a look at some of the user stories that have been developed and as things have been developed they accept them along the way. And they're pretty much deploying, you know, new functionality, say, to your banking um, uh, website where you do your online banking. Um, they'll be pretty much doing a, a deployment every two weeks. Um, and it could be just fixing up errors, um, but it could be actually putting in new functionality as well. So you can see there on the left-hand side, we've got this product solution backlog and everything's being Moscowed. And you would be using the 60-20-20 rule in terms of how big they are to solve. Um, and then what we'd be doing is allocating those user stories or a subset of that, that um, main backlog into a project increment and then further um, taking those user stories and solving them in each sprint. Um, and what we try and do is we deploy along the way. It may not always be possible, uh, but very agile teams are deploying at the end of every sprint, um, as I explained um, just a moment ago. Um, but normally what happens is that we line up a few sprints and we, and we plan a deployment at the end of that. Um, we can have as many project increments as we like and we can have as many sprints as we like, uh, but ultimately what we're trying to do is build up our solution from, um, uh, from, a, uh, from a small base, meaning we've developed part of the functionality in one project increment um, we might be able to deploy that and then the next project increment we add on to that and we keep on adding on until we've finally got a, a, a deployed solution which is the full solution. Um, in terms of planning, we allocate user stories to increments and sprints. <clears throat> so um, that is a very um, quick um, introduction to Agile <clears throat> and especially in terms of what the, um, what you could use in terms of um, uh, methods for SIs and your customers. Um, it isn't like, unlike any other methodology, um, it uh, does take time. Um, there is rigor in it. Uh, you do need to do a, an appropriate amount of front end loading at the start and the more you're um, entwined with your customer, the better the result that you're going to, going to get. Um, if you need any implementation advice, you can click me an email on that email address that's on the slide. Um, but also I'll be at the conference this year, as Tony mentioned earlier. Um, so if you want to grab me and, um, and sit down and have a coffee or a drink and talk about a little bit more about these techniques, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk to you at the conference if that's what you'd like to do. Um, if there is any Q&A or any questions that people would like to ask, Please do so now.
Um, there were there were questions in the Q and A in case you didn't see them or answer them. Oh, yes. I see. Okay, where, where do I see those? I can't see them on my screen at the moment. My apologies. Oh yes, here it is. Okay, so there is quite a few questions in there. I'm sorry I didn't see them along the way. Uh, with the increased frequency of potential customer changes, how do you control scope, budget and timing and not let the project spin out of control? Um, uh, that is by the uh, prioritisation um, methodology there, uh, Jason, I think I'm talking to you there. Um, and that's, that's how we basically do that. But again, you need to spend the time up front with your customers to understand you know, what you're not going to deliver um, versus um, what you must deliver. Um, I'm seeing the PowerPoint and hearing the video, that's not. Yeah. We are using a tool called version one for our planning and tracking of tasks. Um, I haven't heard of um, a, a version one uh, yet, but I might take a look at that, thanks. Um, do I need to shift, shift from a technical approach to delivery to a more functional approach? And if not, what does this mean for the employee involved? Um, I do think it means that we need to um, uh, to um, talk to our clients in terms of the language that they understand. Um, so in terms of that, we um, are moving to a more um, customer-centric approach. Um, but at the end of the day, what we do as system integrators is technically orientated. Um, so uh, we still need to be technical and we still need rigour around our technical processes. Um, and, but we do need to talk about function um, and we do need to talk about the expectations that the clients um, have in terms of what the basic functionality of the solution should be. Um, I'm not sure what it says, what does this mean for the employee involved. I think what it does, um, what it does present in terms of problems for engineers is, you know, that they can't basically sit down in the corner and deliver a, and sit down for two weeks and work on technical requirements and deliver those without actually involving the customer in terms of like demonstration, in terms of mock-ups and things like that, that they would show the client to make sure that they're on the right path along the way. Um, so if you've got engineers that really don't like to be in front of customers, and that is what we do have um, certainly in our, in our, uh, in our industry, then that's going to be a challenge for them. So um, for me, when uh, I've done that with uh, in my own business, then it's basically to sit down um, with my employee and to talk to them about what the expectations of are, are in terms of customer collaboration in this agile environment. Um, is the increment the same as a release? Um, yes, you could say it is because we are releasing um, uh, or deploying how do you incrementally deploy a control cabinet? Um, well, I, well, I guess um, you would need to, um, well, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Um, I think it's probably a bit of a tongue in cheek um, comment and I, and I like that, that's pretty good. Um, but we, um, so you've got to use Agile for the right reasons and in the right processes. Um, I don't think um, in terms of manufacturing, Agile is particularly suited, um, but you certainly can use um, mock-ups um, along the way. You can run your, run your, um, uh, the build of your, um, of your cabinet in terms of using a sprint for your internal team, uh, but you may well get your customer involved at the start, as we normally do, to show them a mock-up of what it's going to look like and where all the buttons are going to be and where all the interfaces are going to be all that sort of stuff. So um, you can involve them in that way. Um, but generally what we do use Agile for is um, essentially for code development, uh, for functionality. Um, <clears throat> and so that's where it's mostly used. But we use, in our business, we use Agile techniques um, and especially sprint work um, to do anything. Um, 
uh, and a Kanban board uh, that we um, sit with in a daily stand up with our client every day for 15 minutes um, is one of the ways that we get very much um, uh, entwined with our clients so that we understand along the way what we're developing. One of the key terms our company has found the most value is the daily stand-up meeting. Have you seen that being a benefit as well? Absolutely. It is probably, um, Jeff, that's probably the most valuable uh, technique or agile technique that we use um, in our business every day. And like I was saying, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, software code that we're developing that um, requires that daily stand-up. It's just to get jobs done and to meet very quickly every day and do that daily stand-up. Um, for those that want to understand what that is, we generally have a sprint team that is seven plus and one is two, which is the rule of thumb. And we allow people two minutes a piece to say what they did yesterday, what they're doing tomorrow, and what blockages that they've got. And it's up to the team leader or the project manager to be the unblocker of anything that's um, uh, hindering the team from producing what they need to produce. Um, so, Jeff, I couldn't um, agree any more. That is, that is one of the most valuable um, techniques in Agile. What percentage of your customers engage with Agile development? Um, I would say that 90% um, of our customers are now um, using Agile. Um, and the reason for that is that we've successfully been able to um, explain um, what it means to them, the benefits of using Agile. Um, and the way that we, um, those techniques, how valuable, um, how valuable they are for us to be on the same page as our customer every day. So for argument's sake, we used Agile to, um, there was a, uh, an aged care facility and they had to meet a government um, audit and it was, um, it was due in six weeks time. And what we did was we broke up everything that they needed to do in that six weeks to pass their order into three two-week sprints. And as part of that, we met every day for 15 minutes. Um, and as part of that, as being committed to that um, sprint, I would be logging in from anywhere um, interstate because I have work to do interstate, but I would be religiously ringing at 10 o'clock every morning to, um, to meet with that team to go through the daily stand-up. That way we're concentrating um, on delivering um, what we need to deliver. Um, in terms of prioritising the requirements, <clears throat> we did it in this way. Um, if, you, um, if there was anything that, was, that an auditor would find when they walked in on day one and that, they, that must have been delivered, basically a showstopper if it wasn't there in their system as an aged care facility and they would be um, basically, uh, they wouldn't get their certification that became a must have. Anything that um, they, you'd really expect to see as a should have in terms of like industry expectation would have been a should have and anything that would really, you know, excite them as best practice became a could have. So you can see you can use it in many different ways. <clears throat> in a competitive situation, how does, how does a buyer compare an agile solution with a traditional solution? Well, I think the main advantage there is that we're not going to be um, spending a lot of time in contract negotiation when we know things are going to change. Um, and one of the biggest um, selling points for Agile is the fact that it is time and cost uh, that are fixed, which is obviously um, very desirable from a customer point of view. However, they do need to understand that they're not going to get everything they wanted. Um, so there is a lot of collaboration that happens there and that prioritisation of those requirements or user stories at the um, start of the project are very, very important. Um, what tools do you use to track progress? Um, Microsoft Excel uh, is one of the ones there. Uh, MSTFS, I don't think I've seen that one before. Uh, but in terms of tracking progress, it could be simple as a whiteboard with that, um, that Kanban with the, you know, the sticky notes on there, to so something like Trello or, um, or Jira or Jammer. Those types of tools are very good for, um, uh, but you can use something as, MSA, uh, as simple as um, Microsoft Excel. Um, um, but one of the key things, if you're going to track progress in terms of like a sprint, um, the more visual it is, 
the meaning, it's more visual to your team. They walk past it every day. Um, that's the most valuable one. As soon as you start putting it online, you do um, have the problem that maybe not everybody in the team is going to look at that every day. Uh, to deliver functionality incrementally, one has to be able to prove the functionality without the total system being in place, meaning simulation systems needs to be in place. There's quite some extra effort in that. What is your experience? So let me read through that again. <clears throat> yeah, I think that uh, I think that goes down uh, towards the uh, the point of um, having um, our acceptance criteria inbuilt in, into solving every one of those user stories, um, and maybe part of the part of the your quality system is that the simulation. Um, that part of the acceptance criteria is that the simulation works as, as you thought it might work. Um, <clears throat> so there is quite a bit of extra effort in that. Um, well, there can be, uh, but at the end of the day, you've got to scale it such that you um, are getting um, an acceptance, acceptable level of quality. Um, so not over testing and not under testing. Uh, so agree, the key to limit the stand-up meeting is 15 minutes per day. Absolutely, Jeff. Uh, do you have any guidance to use both technical, uh, traditional and agile integrated since there are some overlapping and, and new to end users? Absolutely. Um, there are methodologies being developed or have already been developed which try to um, have what's called a, um, a hybrid solution or a hybrid methodology. Um, for argument's sake, I'm the um, Agile, um, uh, Chief Agile Consultant for um, one of our water utilities in South Australia called SA Water. Um, and what they are moving towards is something called a bimodal environment, meaning um, that they are using a PRINCE2 type um, governance uh, umbrella, um, but they, um, in terms of delivery, um, they can use either Agile Sprints or normal um, uh, project um, project phases to deliver their uh, deliver their solutions. So uh, it is possible. Um, however, you really need to understand what the um, waterfall environment is and the agile environment in terms to in, in, in integrating the two together. It takes a very mature organisation to be able to do that. Um, there are new methodologies coming along. One is called Prince to Agile. Uh, which does um, uh, attempt to um, integrate the two methodologies together. So if you want to um, Google Prince to Agile, you'll see uh, some information on that, I'm sure. Um, is there a maximum use size of the Agile team during a stand-up meeting? Um, yeah, um, generally, like I said, the rule of thumb is seven plus or minus two, um, but I have dealt with um, teams of up to 14 um, and even managed to um, get them through a 15 minute sprint. Um, because really what we're doing is we're, as I said, each individual is going, what have I done yesterday? What am I doing um, uh, today? What are my blockages? If there is a blockage, they're immediately taken offline because we, um, otherwise we'll sit there and we'll talk about blockages forever and a day and not everybody um, is um, interested in those. Uh, so there's a tool suggestion from somebody there. So Heidi, thank you very much. Um, and that works, and, and that obviously works for them. Um, according to theory, adding or removing a user story allowed during the course of a sprint. Um, generally, um, you could add one um, if you wanted to. Um, but what we do try and do is fix the user stories that we're doing at the start of the um, of the agile sprint. Um, but we, but in terms of like removing the user story, you can remove them. Um, but you start with the could have um, user stories first, um, because obviously, you know, not delivering a must have is really important, and and the project is not is not viable unless you're um, delivering must haves. But you do pull out could haves and should haves if you need some contingency. Um, I think that's all the questions that I got up there. Um, so maybe over to you, Jose or Tony. Thank you, Tom.
Uh, thanks everyone for your participation in today's program. Note that the full webinar will be archived on controlsys.org within the next day or so. Also, many thanks to our host and sponsor, Software Toolbox. Find them on the web at softwaretoolbox.com. Very shortly, you'll receive a 30-second evaluation about today's program. Your feedback is very valuable to us, so we ask that you please complete it. Lastly, if you've not done so already, I encourage you to register for the 2017 CSIA Executive Conference held May 2nd through the 5th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And if you're contemplating CSIA certification, I highly recommend that you sign up for the Best Practices Workshop taking place just prior to the conference on Monday and Tuesday, May 1st and 2nd. Tom Salda will be, the, be part of the instructor team delivering this workshop. This is Tony Verovin at CSIA. Thanks for attending. Goodbye.